So uh, there, there is a handful of people in here that I have never seen. Hey, Jason, I've never met you. <laughs> Did you say Justin? Yeah. <laughs> now you're really good. I know his name now, officially. We, we learned his name, I think. Oh, I actually, I'm the one who got you screwed up on. Yeah, Josh, Josh, right? <laughs> yeah, the next class I called you Justin Jason. or something. Yeah. Yeah. Justin, Jason, Josh, whatever. Yeah, <laughs> anyway, awesome to be with you guys. So I know I know a handful of you here, but George Morris, good to see you, Liam. Good memory. Yeah, how's life treating you? Good. All right, good. So, uh, Oh, there's a good handful of people I don't know. So who's working out of the Union Park office? Most of you? And then uh, out of the Senegal office, anybody? All right. And what's your guys' name? I'm Braden. Braden, and then Jason. Jason, nice to meet you guys. And then anybody out of uh, Orem? We've got a couple of those. Okay. There's a couple others, too. Nice. Here. Wonderful. All right, well, great. Well, <clears throat> you know, it, uh, uh, this is, uh, for me, this is the, the stuff that's the fun stuff. So. You know, it's interesting, every single day we deal with so many different things that uh, aren't always the fun stuff. So, you know, always to, to share the story of the organization and to share the story of what we've done as an organization and how the foundation of the organization really came about as to how we teach, what we talk about, how we train, and really the, the focus of, of an agent. And I, I learned years ago uh, the importance of this, and it was a lot of it was through trial and error, and through that process. So, you know, let me just take you back just a little bit. So, I started my career uh, about 21 and a half years ago, and my story is pretty simple, uh, but it's a true story. I was I was mowing lawns, and so a lot of times I'll be in these meetings, and in fact, I was with. I was uh, at Jones Waldo and uh, John, Jones Waldo and what's the last name? I think there's another attorney's name there, but so right downtown in Salt Lake. Uh, I was down meeting with a handful of attorneys, and and, I, and and every time someone would walk by, it was crazy. I don't know what was going on in this law firm in Jones Jones Waldo. Well, Jones Waldo, uh, but I would meet people. I would see people. I'd raise my hand, and I'd like finally the attorney turned around. Who I'd never met before. I was. How do you know all these people? And I said, well, for so, and, they, and I said, so far I've only seen four people in your law firm that have nothing to do with what I'm working on have walked through your law firm. And I thought, you know, that's that, that that's that's a that's a ways coming from the standpoint of a guy who was just mowing lawns. And and so for me, I, uh, you know, I want to get all the way back to the beginning. So I, I, you know, I've always loved working with people, and it didn't take me too long to figure out that working with people was what I wanted to do. And so I had recently come back from an LDS mission, but while I was in that two year little stint of my life, what I started doing is in the back of my journal, I would write down all these little business ideas that I had. I don't know, my mind was just always churning in that arena. And so I remember I wrote down, the first I wrote down window washing, create a window washing company. The second thing I wrote down was lawn care landscaping sprinkling company. I saw the journal today. And the third thing I wrote down was was uh, real estate. So truly to order, I got home and essentially the first thing I did, I went down to some custodial jan uh, janitor supply place and I bought all the things to be able to like wash windows. And so I, I, I got it all done and then uh, I did that for about a week. And then I realized that that is not what I'm going to do with my life. Uh, and granted, probably could create a company standpoint of all of that, but I'm like, you know, it doesn't have enough impact. I want to really have a strong impact in people's lives. So then, literally, like, probably, I don't remember, but it's probably the very next day or week, all of a sudden I got this idea, let's go out and, and mow lawns. And so I pulled my brother aside and said, hey, we should create this landscaping company. So we created it. And in just a short period of time, I, he started doing, if you would say, a lot of the work. And what I started doing is I would actually go around when we were doing some work and kind of finishing up the last of the work, especially some of these mowing accounts, and I'd start knocking doors. And by the time it was said and done, within like a three-month period of time, we had over 70 mowing accounts. This is you know, 20, over 20 years ago, but it really taught me the fact of how important it is to just door knock and to sell. And I was, We were just talking about... Vivint and how successful they've been. Of course, with them now putting their name on the uh, what, what uh, Energy Solutions slash Delta Center, whatever they call it, right? And 
you know, that whole entire organization is built around this idea of door knocking. I mean, that that's what makes the company the company, is that it is an army of people that go out and door knock. And so, anyway, so I, I remember, though, I was mowing a lawn one day, and I had put an ad in the paper, and I met these one, the, the, this couple. Uh, both of them are still in real estate today, but they're not married, and they're each independently living their lives out together, but both still in real estate. Uh, Austin and Kristen Haywood. You remember the Haywoods? All right. Um, yeah, of course, yeah, Kristen Graziano. So she's one of the managers up there was uh, and works up there up north. But when I met them, I just started mowing their lawn. And I remember I was driving, this is a true story, I was driving this 1978 Dodge Ram Charger, and it was sky blue, rusting out, could have to have the windows open because so much exhaust would come into the car. You couldn't drive it at night because it, the electrical didn't work. You know, so I was the guy, like, I literally I put my hand out, like, when I was going to be turning <laughs> something else. Like, I mean, truly, I'm mean, serious. I really, it's a true story. So I did all that. And then one day I remember I was, I, I figured out what uh, Austin and Kristen did. And I was interested in what they were doing because it was just about the time that the Lexus LS400s had come out. And I wanted to know what they did. And I found out that they sold real estate. So I remember mowing this lawn right on Murray Holiday Road. It was a duplex of theirs. And I was in midstream of mowing a line, if you would say, on the lawn. And I remember that he pulled up in his driveway, or the driveway, uh, with this Lexus brand new LS400, about the color of your shirt. And I remember stopping and looking over. And I still, as clear as day, remember it. And I remember looking at him get out and walk into the house or into the top floor of the duplex. And I remember I said to myself, you know what, if he can do that, so can I. And I remember it so distinctly. And, and so one of the things that, I, that, that got my, I don't guess my wheels churning this business was looking at people who are doing this business and recognizing that, well, if they're doing it, so can I. That there's this evidence that it's not an exclusive club. It's not something any of us can't do. It's not something that I couldn't do. And that's kind of where I got my start and my belief. So from that point, I then said, well, you know what? I'm going to take them to dinner. And I, I kid you not, I had never really gone to nice restaurants. I mean, a nice restaurant for me was Sizzler, I remember. And I remember I asked them, I'm like, hey, can we go take you? And my Jen and I and my wife, can we take you to dinner and you and Kristen? And he's like, well, sure. And, and I remember still saying I want to take him to dinner, and I went to the best place probably that I knew at the time, which was the training table. That is as true as true. And I remember going you know, down the phone, ordering our, ordering our cheese fries, you know, at number 26, and you know. And I remember ordering it, and then we're sitting there, and I was thinking, I'm going to get this incredible story that's going to come down the pipeline from this guy. He's going to tell me how hard it was to get into real estate, and how difficult, and the challenges, and man, it's going to take you forever. And, and I remember he's like, I remember finally, you know, kind of got the nerve thinking I was going to ask some major thing. And he goes, oh, well, now you just need, and now it's 120, but you just have to take 90 hours. You don't have your license. It costs you a thousand bucks and you're on your way. I was like, what? what? I have to go buy lawnmowers. Each one of them worth a thousand dollars. What do you, I mean, true story, snappers, commercial grade. I mean, you know, so right about that time, I mean, my, my brother was going through a little divorce and the good news is the ex-wife like stole all of our money, all of our operating money out of our operating account, which was like $1,200, which seemed like a huge amount of money. <laughs> but she stole it. And so I said, you know what, that's it. And I literally said, I am done. And I sold all of my mowing accounts and my brother and I split them and we sold it. The equipment and everything was paid off, and we made we got we actually made ten thousand bucks. So at first it made me like, you know what, building things and doing that whole process that's kind of a cool thing. And then immediately I went full bore at Stringham, just like probably many of you did, and I went into real estate. And you know my first year in real estate was interesting because there was so much uh, going on from the standpoint that rates had just come from being. 13, 14, 18 percent over the last 24 months. I mean, imagine, you know, here we are in the four percentile, give or take, and rates were 18, 19, 20 percent, right? So they had just started to drop, and I remember people went crazy because rates hit nine to nine and a half percent. They hit into a single digit, and they had not been that way for years. 
So that was the time that I got in, and it was actually, I have to say, it was a little bit like it is today. It was a good market. It was a somewhat hot market. In fact, uh, you know, at times I listed homes, and I thought there's no chance this is ever going to sell, and you know what, it ended up selling. Just like we have, you know, some of the lowest inventory we've had in the last 10 years. If you get a decent listing, there's a pretty darn good chance it's going to sell, even if you didn't know what you were doing, because I know why I didn't back then. Okay, so anyway, so I got in the business my first year, just for perspective, I sold about 33 homes. Um, I referred almost every buyer out. For some reason, I took on this attitude that my whole world and my whole life was going to be about taking listings. I actually believe I could have sold over 50 homes if I would have taken on the buyers, but I just didn't. But I have to tell you, I, I would prospect, in fact, I used to have goals, guys, that I, and so many people go, oh my goodness, I couldn't even think about doing it, but I would make this. I would make 100 contacts a day. And it was either by door or by phone, and I would talk to 100 people a day. And now, if I talked to 100 people a day, I'd probably set four, five, six appointments. I have to tell you that I was lucky if I made one, but I would. And, and I consistently did it, and I was okay with all the rejection, and that's a whole other class we could talk about, how we deal with that much rejection. But it taught me a great lesson that people need our help, and if I just talk to them, good things happen. And either referral, or hey, you should call this guy, or we're not interested in anything, but you should call this people, or hey, my neighbors, I know they're thinking of moving, you should call them, go knock on their door, and just things started to happen because I would talk to people. So. I sold the 33 homes my first year in business, and as I, as I climbed through that process, I had myself where I was in a number of different organizations and companies. But in a general statement of my career, I've sold real estate for about 10 years, and I've built and uh, run brokerages for the last 12, give or take, except for one thing that happened. So I built, I, I started selling close to, I, I, I finished a year of about eight, with about 80 homes sold. And I had this idea that I wanted to buy the very company that I worked for. And they're not really even in our marketplace anymore, but it was Realty Executives. Some of you may recognize that name, but they're a national brand. And I worked for a guy by the name of Robert Fillmore. And Robert Fillmore was just one of the most important mentors of my life. And I wanted his company. I wanted to own his company. And so I remember one day, I'm door handled just like these. Every time I actually open one, I almost always think about that day. I was done talking to him, and I had my hand on the door, and I turned around and I said, Hey, you know, when you retire, you know what? I, I want to buy your company. And I started to walk out, and he had the door cracked open, maybe an inch or two, and he said, Well, why don't you buy it now? And I went, What? I shut the door, and I came walking over. I'm like, What are you talking about? And he says, Well, and then they told me a little story of some things that had happened for him and things that he knew he needed to do. And lo and behold, literally six months later, I own this organization with about 70 agents in it. And from that point, from those 70 agents, within four years, I built up 325 agents, and one out of every 10 homes in the marketplace were sold by realty executives for a period of time. And we controlled you know, 15 or 20% of the listing inventory, and it was a great thing. And then I had this harebrained idea. I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to sell my interest, and I'm going to go do speaking and coaching and other things. And so I actually sold my interest. I owned 50% of the company. And if I sold it, Everyone thought I'd lost my mind because I sold it in January of 2007. And the market was white hot and people thought I'd lost my mind. And they thought, what do you, or, or then other people come, well, do you know something that we don't? And I have to tell you, back then, even as I look back, I'm like, not really. I just felt impressed that I should do it and I did it. So I did it. I sold my interest. 18 months later, that organization went completely under and you know, that was an interesting time because I always tell people I learned how to actually build a company. I didn't really necessarily learn how to sell a company. And so my name remained on a number of things. And so some of you certainly have been around me, you know, Jonathan and others, a long time. And, you know, that moment, my whole world came crashing down because my name remained on different liabilities that I had no control of an asset for. And all of a sudden, I watched my whole world spiral. I watched my net worth, I watched all my cash in my bank account, I mean, everything disappear. I remember I had, you know, I had home in St. George, I had, you know, the different cars, the different toys, all the different things, cash in the bank. I, I, in fact, I remember I had calculated that I didn't need to work for the next decade and I would be okay. And that was a pretty cool place to be, by the way, at about 33, 34 years old, knowing 
that for the next decade, if you never worked, you'd still be okay and provide for your family. Well, that all came unraveling like nobody's business, like a tornado when the market started to crash. And the market that you often hear people talk about, that it was so destructive that I still remember, you know, as I'm sitting on the deck, sorry, standing on the deck with my wife, and we're overlooking the desert in St. George. And man, whew, gosh, it, it brings me the chills, and I had to just a second make sure I changed my thought, Josh, so that I didn't break into a tear or two. Because I still remember my wife just tears streaming as she watched this life that we had created completely dismantle itself financially, but where we had created memories and all of these different things. And um, those were humbling times. That weekend, as I closed the door on that home, and basically just simply said, you know, here, you know, here you go, bank, and met the agent. They were reselling it and doing the whole thing, and it was gone. And uh, you know, crazy it was. This home was worth four hundred and forty thousand dollars when I sold it. When they resold it, they sold it for one hundred and seventy thousand dollars, which is crazy. I think to myself, remember they gave me a uh, ten ninety nine for forty thousand dollars, and I said, wow, count my lucky stars of how upside down that home became with the market when it crashed. That same weekend, I was so embarrassed because my friend, who I live just a uh, block away from, is the general manager of BMW, and I was so embarrassed and disappointed in myself that I actually drove my BMW, my M6 convertible, to the Las Vegas BMW and turned in the keys and said, here you go, I can't, have, I can't take it anymore, but here's the car. So basically, from cars to the houses, to then it didn't get any worse. It got worse to where I became, where I was eight hours away at 4.50 p.m. that night on a Thursday, and Friday the next morning, my home was gonna be sold at auction. Uh, auction, I needed auction. <laughs> at auction. At auction. And I just want to make, give you perspective, guys. This is all five, six years ago. So you know, people will come to me and they'll think, they'll see me speak or they'll think, Oh, you know, life was so awesome. I mean, you must have it always so figured out. And I'm like, no, I mean, I lost everything financially. I, I mean, and, and I've been fortunately, I had this little guardian angel, if you would say, in life that came and said, you know what, hey, let me give you a little bit of money. And that's where I was able to pay to stay in the very home I'm still in today, which I'm very grateful. I have a whole different appreciation for the home I live in today. Not only just because it's where my family's been raised for the last decade of my life, but it's also just the fact that the, what it means to me and how I was able to keep it. And I have to tell you, honestly, I will sometimes sit on a door and I'll put my hand on it and I'll almost talk to my house and say, I am grateful that I have this home. And so I just, I, I hope that anything I may share with you today, that as you take a step back and you look and then, you know, Leanne got to hear about all the, the, the health issues at the same time. I mean. If you haven't heard it, you should know it. And the only reason I want you to know it is that sometimes people will see me and they'll give me such a poor judgment. They think, well, man, he's so passionate about a principle, so passionate about an idea, so strict in like what he thinks it should be to how real estate should be sold. But I have to tell you, it comes from the standpoint of just my experiences. And it comes from the standpoint of knowing what it takes to sell real estate in today's market. That same year, so five, six, or four or five years ago, was when I had to have heart surgery. And every day, even today, I'm twisting in my chair and I feel a pain in my chest. Every moment, I'm always thinking, maybe something's wrong with my heart. Because I had an electrical issue with my heart. And I had to rewire it so it didn't miss beats. And it was the ventricular tachycardia. And then I blew out my knee. And then I had to have eye surgeries. And this staph infection almost killed me. And then, so you certainly have heard where I was choked to death on a bottle cap, essentially that popped off a bottle. And all of that happening, so so imagine this, so all of the financial stuff is going on, my whole world unraveling. <coughs> then I have all this health stuff, and by the way, all of that health stuff, it was on May 27, 2009, when this company was created. I was in surgery in February, or March, sorry, no, March 3rd of 2010 for heart surgery, and for a straight year and a half, my life unraveled financially and with my health. And the only thing that stayed together, fortunately, was my marriage. 
which even then, not that it got rocky where it wasn't going to work out, but just you can imagine the strain and the struggle that goes on when there's finances and health issues and all those different dynamics. It just changes everything, and the challenges that come with all of that are very, very trying. So I just I hope that you recognize that this organization, and it's the question I ask, and that is, is always, what is Everest? You know, what is it to an individual? And I always say, for me, it's been a healing. It's been a place where I've been able to come and heal, whether it be through the standpoint of just the, the great um, gaping, gouging holes that life created, but it also helped me to, in some words, resurrect my ability to figure out how to run a company and build a company. And you probably know this, but just imagine, though, in these, these, these six years that we've been in business, this is the number one real estate office in the world for Century 21. And it was three years ago that we became number one. So in a three year period of time, from five guys sitting around a table just about this size, or four, four guys and a gal, Grinch and Smoot, and I posed the question when all heck, when everything was going crazy, I said we should create a real estate company. And true to his words, some of you have certainly heard John Syed speak, and John said, you know what, if anybody else, true story, not elaborating, anyone else would have said that I would have said you are crazy and that's where the really the story began from the standpoint of everyone was hemorrhaging and if he didn't tell you John Syatt I remember he called me a year before and these were his words there's only two people on the earth that I could call and they and they would cheer for my success and John called me just the year before so 2008 right he called me and he said I am a millionaire. And I said, that is awesome. Like, he's been my best friend for 22 years. And I said, he goes, I'm a liquid millionaire. I have one million dollars in my bank account. And I want you to know that. I mean, you know, I know you cheer for me. Well, more, but I want you to know because, I mean, but not from that, like, you know, not, not, not a competitive level. <laughs> no. No. No, it wasn't that. I know. But, but he goes, I want you to know that because you're only, you know, like, you know when you have something so awesome and you accomplish your achieve something, you know there's only a handful of people that will cheer for you. There's other people you'll tell them, look what I did. And they're like, who do you think you are doing something so great? Not that. He called me because he knows that I would be cheering for his success and so excited for him. So he had this grand idea, this grand hoorah, if he hasn't said it, to build this awesome home up in Park City, up in Glen Wild, kind of let it be his last little hoorah before he stopped doing his normal day job. And I told him, Glenn, I told him, do not do this. But he had another friend. Remember I told you there's one or two friends? Guess what the other friend told him? Do it! The market's not going to crash. It's not going to, oh, people are, you know, doom and gloom. It's not going to be anything like that. Well, anyway, less than 12 months later, he had that million dollars that he had put the entire amount into that home. And the value of that home that had a $14,000 a month mortgage before he was able to get it sold because he built it to sell, right? So he did that. And by the time it was said and done, he walked away with just shy of $250,000. He paid off all of his debts and he had a hundred grand left over. And that hundred grand is the very dollars that invested in this company to create its infant from its infancy to what it is today. So in the first year, because he had no debt, he literally took no salary for a year. I took a $35,000 salary. Rob took $37,000. So a lot of times when you think about what this company is, it is people will come and say, oh, it's corporate. You have no idea what they have, or they have no idea what they're saying. Because this organization started at its infancy Again, with five people, or four guys and one gal, sitting around a room saying, hey, we should create a company. And you know, from what we had learned, not what I had learned, is we know how to do that. And so we did it very quickly, and it was very speedily done from the standpoint of what this market can do. I just want you to know that only from the standpoint, again, that you know that at its core, this organization, at its heart, is about people and that it doesn't work without people. The organization or a real estate organization is worthless because in the sense of assets that, you know, what, a fan, a computer. I mean, reality is real estate companies, banks don't like them, and this is the reason. They're worthless from the standpoint of a, that, that because the assets have names and it's a service industry, 
they know that the assets, if you would say, can walk out at any point. So banks don't like assets that can walk out. They like them to stay put. So if they don't get paid, they can go get it. But they can't go get you, right? So it's interesting, the value of the organization is built in the people. And I have to, you know, my mantra is that over my lifetime is that I've chosen to invest in people far more than I've invested in real estate. People always ask me, how much real estate do you own? You know what? Everything that I have and everything I do is invested in this company. Uh, if people say, well, that means you put almost all your eggs in one basket. Yeah, all of it. Because this organization to me is the most important thing because, again, for me, it's been a healer. But for you, you know, each one of you sitting here, you know, you'll have a different perspective from Everest. You'll learn different things. You'll be trained. Uh, it'll be a place where maybe you explode from the standpoint financially. It'll be a place where you get educated, where you meet friends. It will be at times a healer. It'll be a stabilizer. It'll be something where you get structure, learning, growth, friendships, associations that'll last your lifetime. John Syatt, where I started my career 22, almost 22 years ago, he was there just a few months before that as a newer licensee also. And today this company is here because two guys met in a class just like this. So I hope that you recognize that what you're a part of is something pretty darn special. And we believe we have a great stewardship and we have a great responsibility to build this organization and to help a lot of people become their very best. We talk about personal development, we talk about that dynamic of improving ourselves. Really the dynamic is nothing more, nothing less than simply becoming your very best. And Josh's may be different than Leanne's, and Leanne's will be different than Chris, Liz, all right, Chris, Liz, right, right, okay? But my point is, is that as you guys go through this, you know what, your best is gonna be different than anybody else's best, and that's okay, all right? So, back in 1994, when I started my career, and about a, within about six months to 12 months later, I was kind of getting what I would consider kicked around. What I mean by that is I would go on appointments and I wouldn't take the listing. I'd set an appointment and I wouldn't get the listing. I'd go out on a for sale owner and I wouldn't get the listing. And so I took a step back and asked a question. And the question was really this. What do great real estate agents do. I still have the two sticky notes. They're in a journal in my basement. And I just asked that question. And over the last 20 years or so, I've refined that question and to where every part of this organization and everything that it's about is built on this foundation. So I usually just quickly wrap it up there and go, here's our foundation. This is what all training, all great agents will do. And it doesn't matter whether I'm speaking in front of a other business or uh, whether it's real estate agents, the foundation is exactly the same. Now, there'll be maybe a skill set that'll be different, but it's still part of it is the skills. So as you guys go through your training, I guess the thing I would just echo to you is that recognize that you can chase a lot of different things in this business but if you want to make the dollars that are available in this business, not this company, this business, then you've got to create the right foundation. So I started looking at top agents, and I just simply asked the question again, in so many words, what do these guys do? What do these gals do? And why is it, and I, I remember the last listing that I lost uh, before I wrote this down, it was a gal, she's a top agent still today, her name's Joan Page, she's a dear friend, and Joan, beat me up again and I didn't get the listing. I was like, come on, what's the deal? And so that's when I came up with this question to go, all right, I gotta figure out what are they doing? And so again, over the last 20 years, defining that, refining that, tweaking it to where I can look at anybody and go, all I have to do is look at what you're doing with your time in relationship to this foundation. And in a heartbeat, I can figure out whether you're going to make money or you're gonna make, no, make money or no money or a little bit of money, or a lot. So what I hope that you would look at and you would ask yourself is, do I have this foundation in place? Am I working towards this foundation? And if you do, great things will happen. And you'll have extraordinary success. Okay? So, any thoughts, any questions? None? 
Pardon? What's the foundation? We're going to go over it right now. Good question. Please. Um, when did you start implementing Mike Berry? You know, I had I had the opportunity to go to him about the first month of my business, and I saw him go at an act to an action workshop, or he went. He did an action workshop in Salt Lake City. And I went. So very early on in my career, I got very grounded on what I should be doing. So I got real grounded on the fact that I know that I needed to talk to people. The challenge in real estate is we're in sales, and people want all the money, but they don't want to talk to all the people. They want all the success that real estate can bring, but they rarely talk to enough people. I mean, even look at the last week. How many people have you really spoken to about real estate? How many people really know what you're trying to do and how you could help them? And it's almost impossible to make a lot of money in this business without talking to people. People are not going to call you just because you exist. They're not going to just reach out just because you are, you know, what, God's gift on real estate. I mean, just they're not. That's just not how it works. I wish it did, but they just don't. And so you've got to reach out and become of value to them. And the only way you're going to do that is you're going to have to talk to a lot of people. So, you know, what I had to do is I, because I didn't, I didn't have the skill sets, I had to increase the number of people I spoke to. So sometimes uh, when a newer licensee will compare themselves to an agent who has all the skill sets and some of the dynamics, and they see them like prospect for an hour, and they go, well, they prospected an hour. I should be able to do the same, and it'll be all be good for me. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. So the foundation built around these things but there was something in this last 20 years, it was about 15 years ago, I realized what every info commercial is about, what every person wants to create in their life, is that they want to have these three things in their life that they master. And if you look at it, you know, most people say, well, aren't we here about the money? Fair statement, it's one of the things you should master. You should major in economics, there's no question about it. And you should be able to do two things, create cash flow, and you should certainly create assets. And you've got to master it. You can't just ignore it. You can't say, oh, well, it's not really, that's just not me. You've got to master money. The ability to create consistent cash flow and have the assets at some point that you build, you create, you buy, and have those assets turn into cash flow in your later years or as you move through. You can't ignore that. You have to be focused on saying, okay, what things am I going to master in my life? Then, number two is, look, it's almost impossible in this business to be wealthy if you're not healthy. So I'm always obsessed with something about my health. Because I realize that these two things, boy, they are so connected. In the book, uh, Millionaire Mindset by T. Harv Ecker, he says, look, in order to be wealthy, you have to be healthy. It's just not going to happen otherwise. It won't. And then the third thing we have to make sure we master is we've got to make sure that we master the relationships in our life, right? And I always say that there's three of them. There's that spiritual one, whatever that one is for you, right? Heavens, you want to go hug trees? Master it. <laughs> I don't care. But you better get somehow, whether it's the energy of the universe or a higher power or a God, whatever you want to talk about, the fact is, is you better get centered spiritually at some level. Because it's almost impossible to be successful without it. Right? In fact, Jennifer and I were having a great conversation about yoga, different things that center her. You've got to do that. If you don't, it's going to be really, really harder than it needs to be. Second, there's obviously the intimate relationship that every one of us needs to create. You've got to have that significant other person in your life. And it's something that you need to create and you need to also become the person who attracts the person you want to have in your life. It's important. It's not just the fact, well, I want this and this and this, but I'm none of those things. If what I've done for years, years when I sit down with people in real estate, because they'll have such heartache over this part of their life, is I just make them define who they want. And then I always come back with this question. Are you those things? Well, uh, hmm. Well, you're not going to get that until you become those things. And you know what's interesting? The moment they become the very things that they define in the relationship that they want, instantly. It's almost like as if, like, you know, the water's parted and all of a sudden, boom, the person shows up in their life. Always the case. And then the third, you could say family, but I often, I need to put four things down here. 
but I always say everyone else. Your ability to communicate and relate is paramount that when you can get to where 100 contacts equals one appointment, to where guys, I can call now five people, cold call. I've done it so many times in live calls right here, even in this room. I'll get on a phone in front of a group of 30, 40 people, and I'll call five people randomly out of the phone book. And I will generate one appointment, and at worst, one solid lead. But that's because it's an ability to communicate, not because I'm any better than anybody else as a person. It's just, how do you relate, and how do you communicate? The reason that Oprah Winfrey, the reason that a Barbara Walters earns the money that they do, it is their ability to communicate. They get more done in less time. They succeed in their communication at much higher levels than other people do. They might have other part of their lives that seems so screwed up, but boy, when it comes to communicating, there aren't too many people better than the Barbara Walters or an Oprah Winfrey. I mean, they're at the top of the game when it comes to the ability to communicate. Whether you like Obama, whether you like his policy, his procedures, his politics, is irrelevant. He connected to the American people because of the way in which he related and the way in which he communicated. It's fascinating. So when you start thinking about what is this business about, you know, maybe you went to the parade of homes. Maybe you went and said, I love real estate, so I'm going to go sell homes. You're not selling real estate. You're selling you. And once you are committed and connected to that person, then all of a sudden the real estate takes care of itself. Remember, you're not selling real estate. You're selling. The first sale that has to be made is what? You, you guys, right? So for years, I used to have a dry erase board that said, things I must master. And the reason why this is so important is that no matter what, our whole lives, this will be areas of our life that we will have to master. And if we don't, that's not going to work real well. That's what I figured out probably 10 or 15 years ago. Now let's go back to this foundation. But I realized that every part of this foundation drives back to those three fundamentals. Okay? Any thoughts, questions? Gosh, are we doing okay? Yes? I'm trying to share so much stuff. I, I'm not, and what, 